when I was spending some time in villages in India, it became pretty clear that in a village, things that you would imagine that are known to everybody, like the presence of a, a microfinance institution, or maybe the best way to feed your cow in order to maximize how much fat is in its milk, this kind of information hadn't spread throughout the community. It's actually a little bit shocking if you have a bank having weekly or bi-weekly meetings, or if you have, you know, um, hundreds and hundreds of villagers who have had, uh, who have been dairy farmers for uh, generations, systematically speaking every day about their own dairy production process. How is it possible that information didn't spread throughout the village? And so the way you need to actually solve this issue in some sense is that information doesn't actually spread completely. But if information doesn't spread completely, this means that everybody is not talking to everybody. And worse yet, um, the information isn't actually flowing very well through this network. And so understanding the shape of how people speak to each other ends up being pretty important. That kind of line of inquiry really motivated me into studying the economics of social networks in developing the economies. If you take India, um, savings are pretty much accessible in most areas. You could save in a post office. Formal savings are accessible. But it's not like insurance is widely available. Uh, you don't see a ton of health insurance. You don't see a lot of take up of crop insurance. If people get uh, lose their jobs, um, they're going to be in a bit of trouble. And so what do people do? People actually go to others in their community or um, uh, their kin, and they'll ask them for money. They'll ask them for assistance. And so this is an example of how the informal relationships actually substitute for a formal object that should be there. Um, maybe the most familiar version of this is a chit fund, right? Um, a chit fund is exactly where people get money from others in a time of need where in every, say, month, um, the group of people have put money together in a pot. And then when it's your turn or when you really need it, you're able to take a large sum to really help yourself. Um, you can represent this as just a network. You can say there's a collection of people and these are the people that they would uh, 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 rely on in a time of need. And this gives you a sort of shape, a geometry over the network. And it turns out that how well the village is able to, say, help each other out in time of need is going to be a function of the shape of that network that we would then draw. My technical work has mostly focused on how either to encourage information to diffuse widely or how to make sure that when there's uncertainty, people resolve the uncertainty and really figure out what's the true state of the world. Um, let me give you an example in the context of public health because the scale of uh, the reach of these ideas is pretty obvious. So the way immunization works in rural India is they use immunization camps. They set up these camps and um, people uh, will bring their children um, and get vaccinated at the camp. This will be roughly monthly. And it's interesting because people mostly understand that vaccines are good and they actually are interested in getting their kids vaccinated. But nonetheless, uh, take up is low. This can range from like 40 to 60 percent. And so you might wonder, how do we get people to actually get their children immunized? Seems like a basic problem. And we've thought about things like let's pay the kid, uh, pay the parents, not the kids, or let's um, give the parents reminders, um, let's send them messages, call them. And this all seems great, but networks provides a very funny insight. It says maybe all you need to do is you need to remind the person in the village who's very well positioned to spread information. Like, let's call them a gossip. And if you remind the gossip, it might be enough because they'll then diffuse the information that there's a vaccine camp this Saturday to enough people that people will show up and they'll actually get their shots. Um, it's a simple idea, and yet it's one that's unexplored unless you think hard about networks. Um, and it works at a policy scale. We actually did this. Um, we, we covered roughly 40% of Haryana with, um, with an experiment that varied whether or not we paid caregivers um, to vaccinate their children, whether or not we sent reminders, both SMS and a voicemail, to, to go get the shots and whether or not um, we gave just a few people in the village information that a vaccine camp was upcoming and their only task was to just spread the information like gossip. And it turned out, including that last bit, increased uh, immunization rates by 44%, which is enormous and also incredibly cheap because you, you could leverage this very simple idea that gossips matter to be able to really improve something that's very practical for public policy. I'm interested in using a lot of distinct methodology because I think any given method is limited by construction. It teaches you only so much and it only gives you scope to learn things under a given set of assumptions. Um, I'll give you an example. So during the Indian demonetization, it was a complicated time because 
about 85% of circulating currency had to be exchanged. It's going to be confusing as to how to do it, even if information is widely available, because rules change many times. I think in that seven weeks, maybe like 54 rules might have changed. And, you know, rurally, there's a lot of illiteracy. Education isn't super high. It's, it's a complicated thing to do, especially in this sort of dynamic environment. And so you naturally think, well, we should try really hard to make sure that people learn how to exchange their currency. Let's pump out a lot of information out there. If you think about the underlying economic models, it's a little bit more complicated. Imagine I'm in a world in which um, you and I both know that we've watched a public broadcast on the demonetization. Um, if we've both watched this broadcast, that means that we both know that we both learned that the rules have changed and we should go try to exchange a currency in such a way. What's the problem? The problem is, if I'm a little bit confused now, I might be worried that if I come to you and I ask you for clarification, you think, hey, he couldn't figure that out on his own. It was obviously on the TV. That intersects with networks in a very interesting way. If you imagine that I was interested in speaking to you, that's a link. This might mean that I drop my link to you exactly because I know that you know that I received information and yet I'm confused. And so exactly in the moment where the information can be complex or confusing, we might all drop our links because we don't want to seem foolish. That works if this kind of economic model is happening. But maybe this doesn't happen. Maybe people don't care about feeling, uh, about appearing ignorant. Or, and if they don't care about this, it's great. If I know that you know that I've received information, then there might be an enthusiasm and we might actually speak more. So the underlying economic model tells you that two very different things can happen. If you give information to everybody all at once and everybody knows it, if you broadcast it, on the one hand, people might be very enthusiastic and might speak a lot and they might really learn. On the other hand, people might actually become discouraged because what happens is that they might think, oh my gosh, if I go and ask you for information, you'll think I was not smart enough to figure it out on my own. So there's two different regimes. The only way to figure out which world you're in is to actually do an experiment. So this is an example where the economic models can give you divergent predictions and you need an experiment in the field, ideally, to resolve it. My collaborators and I have another piece of work where we looked at what happened when you introduce microcredit to villages or um, neighborhoods in a city. And the logic of microcredit is a lot like giving a credit card to an individual. Somebody couldn't really borrow much before. You've given them the, past, uh, the opportunity to borrow now, and it really helps them out. Um, they can smooth their consumption, um, and this is great. What this also means is that if I don't need your assistance now because I can go borrow, then you know I don't need your assistance. And because of this, that means that you know that I don't find an outsized reason to help you in your time of need. And so the relationship with us might thin a little bit. Fine. So you might think, well, this is local. Like if you have access to microcredit, it might affect people who you had links with. But the policy implication is much more complicated and much more massive. What we find in our experiment is that people who have absolutely nothing to do with those involved with microcredit lose their own links. That is to say that if you and I um, both join microcredit, it makes sense if we lose our links. But if some two people over there who had nothing to do with microcredit are in the same village, they actually start to lose relationships between each other. So in some sense, the provision of credit to me and you actually has implications for insurance for people way downstream who live in our village but have no actual relationship with microcredit whatsoever. Um, so it tells us when we want to design products like these, we have to think about the network as a whole, as one entity, and not individuals that are sort of separate. A big push lately in um, economics, and in particular in development economics, is this idea that we learn from multiple studies in multiple areas, um, and we try to put this information together to really understand what is what we call generalizable, right? What is sort of really the meat of what's going on and how we can use this to design policy. So you might think that there are a number of immunization studies done throughout the world or throughout India, and we want to put all this information together. We also call these meta-analyses. Uh, the, the difficulty there is really understanding, does what we learn in Hyderabad on this topic really teaches about a similar phenomenon in Poland? or in Mongolia, or how much of what we learn in Mongolia and India applies to Mexico? Um, that's a very complicated question. 
Um, and I'm really interested in understanding if what are the limits to what we can actually say in a credible way without really overstepping our bounds. Because I think it's very dangerous when we become um, too self-assured, when we take a lot of information from a lot of different studies that in principle should not really be compared, stick them together, and then say maybe overconfidently that we have a certain policy conclusion. Oftentimes I think it's better to say we're actually ignorant or we're limited in what we know and so I want to really work out the technical details of this. This is extremely important, I think, from a policy perspective, because you want to suggest policy that what I would call robust. Like if you're slightly wrong about the economics, slightly wrong about the statistics, slightly wrong about the, the actual experimental design, you want the policy to still work pretty well. Otherwise, if it's really sensitive to any of these assumptions, I think we're peddling dangerous, dangerous ideas. It's a huge honor to win this prize. I'm, uh, I was shocked, thrilled. Um, it's, it's an amazing recognition um, for our team's uh, scholarship. And it's especially nice given that the idea of using network tools in development economics is, is, is new and um, sort of a burgeoning space. I'm really hoping that that would encourage other researchers to work on questions like this. Uh, using their own voice. It's also personally particularly meaningful to me because I'm not, I'm not exactly here because I'm interested in economics broadly. I'm working in economics because I wanted to work on development economics in India, and I found my voice to do this through the language of networks. So the Infosys Prize in Economics is a recognition um, that's particularly meaningful. It occupies a very special space for me in that sense because of my interest in working in economics to work on questions in India itself.